Well, I'm so glad that you decided to join us. This is the seventh Tuesday after the season of Pentecost, that time of the gift of the Holy Spirit. We want to thank you for joining us today for our continuing reading of the book of Genesis. Let's begin with prayer today. Heavenly Father, we pray that your blessing would be upon us as we, um, as we read from your word, that you might inspire us with your presence. For you ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to give a little bit of background. We've been, again, reflecting on the lessons that are read on Sunday uh, the book, in the book of Genesis, that continuous reading. As I mentioned last week, we don't get the entire reading on our Sunday morning worship services or at our Sunday morning worship services because, again, it depends upon us reading every single day during the week as well. Um, so we're going to skip from the lesson that we had last week. Remember how Jacob and Esau were battling for preeminence? Well, Jacob kind of won. With the help of his mom, I told you they were scheming and conniving in order to get the birthright and the inheritance, deceiving Isaac, Jacob and Esau's father, so that the person who would receive that blessing, the person who received that inheritance, would be Jacob. But there's consequences to this type of conniving. Remember, what's Jacob's name again? Jacob, the heel grasper. That's what that word means. He's always trying to take by force what doesn't belong to him. If God wants to bless you, you don't take it by force. God will give it to you. See, Isaac was a good man. He listened to God. Unlike his father Abraham, who at times always tried to make things happen when they weren't happening according to what he thought God's plan should be. It took him a long time to learn. Isaac learned those lessons right away. He was always faithful. Jacob, oh my goodness, we're back to another Abraham character. This boy is always wrestling and struggling and fighting, trying to get ahead trying to get what's his. And God just like, if I'm going to bless you and make you a father of many nations, let me do it for you. You don't have to make it happen. Jacob didn't learn that. So there's consequences to his bad behavior, and that includes, most importantly, broken relationship with his twin brother Esau in separation from his family. So he deceived his father, he deceived his brother, he got the birthright and the inheritance, the consequence is separation and relationship, and that's where we begin today's story, because Jacob is now running for his life. Esau's a little PO'd at this point, okay? Can't blame him. Esau is madder than a hatter, because Jacob, his brother, is living up to his name. So let me read to you this lesson. Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place. He spent the night there because the sun was, had set, and he took one of the stones to place it under his head and lay down in that place. Can you imagine that's your pillow? Oh, my goodness. That's a pretty rough pillow, putting a rock under your head. Uh, you got to believe that at this point, Jacob had regretted his decisions. The deception that he had uh, pulled upon his father and his brother. Here he is, he's living out in the wilderness, he's got inheritance. What good is it for if you can't even collect it? What good is it if you can't even live around the family that supposedly loves you? So you got to imagine here he is running for his life, living in the wilderness with a rock underneath his head for a pillow. My goodness, he's fallen hard. All because he wanted to take by force things that didn't belong to him. Remember, the book of Genesis is the anti-violence book. And so the acts of violence, it's God trying to reconcile us and say, this is not my way. But Jacob hadn't been listening. Here he's laying down. He knew he really messed up in life. <laughs> and then God comes to him in a dream. I find that amazing. See, we always think that it's our behavior that earns God's blessing. Well, this man was an ill-behaved young man, had many problems, 
but yet God still was going to bless him. See, God never breaks his promises. Let's go on. So he had a dream. Here he is, laying on his rock. Give me some nightmares. Behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, with its top reaching to the heavens, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. The land in which you lie, I will give to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south, and in you, and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go. Listen to this. Jacob was trying to take it by force and do it himself. What does God say? Behold, I'm with you. Stop trying to do this for yourself, Jacob. I'm with you. I will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. So Jacob woke from his sleep. Surely the Lord is in this place. I didn't know it. Jacob was afraid. But he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose up early in the morning and he took a stone that he put his head under, under his head. And he set up a pillow, poured oil on it, and its top, and he called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been named Luz. God again reiterated his promise to Jacob that it's not going to be you that makes this promise or fulfills this promise. I'm going to do it because I love you and I want to bless the nations through you. God promised his protection of him. And then when he got up in the morning, I loved how Jacob at least finally recognized that he had been in the presence of God. He named that place Bethel, the house of God. Beth, Bet, Bet is house, El of God, the house of God. This was the location of Jewish worship. It's the center of Jewish worship prior to Jerusalem becoming a thing, okay? Just before the nation was actually created. What did we learn from this? You can be a really rotten person, and you may well be. You can do some really crummy things and nasty, outright, uh, devious things in your life, but this will not prevent God from fulfilling his purposes in your life. <laughs> your misdemeanors and bad behaviors will not keep God from loving you. Your drug addiction will not keep God from loving you. The stupid things that you said and did to your family will not keep God from loving you. The dishonest things that you said to your next door neighbor will not keep God from loving you. Setting off fireworks at 3 a.m. and waking up the entire neighborhood, not going to keep God from loving you. Why do I say that? Because my neighbor did it four nights in a row to me, 3 a.m., setting off 20 fireworks at 3 a.m. Yeah, ticked me off a bit. But you know what? I may not love my neighbor right now, but God does. Because my neighbor setting off those fireworks may tick me off, but God still loves my neighbor. What do we learn? There's nothing that you have done in your entire life. See, this is a theme in the Bible. There's nothing you've done in your entire life that will chase God away from you and make you unlovable to God. Might make you unlovable to everybody else, but there's nothing that you've done that will stop God from loving you. God is relentless, okay? Notice, though, this is important. That doesn't mean that you have a right then, oh, I can go out and do anything I want to. God's going to love me. Well, yes, it's true. But at some point when God's love gets a hold of your life, you're going to want to change. Not because you have to to earn God's pleasure, but because you understand how deeply and passionately in love God is with you and you want to love God the same way in return. So notice God's love and commitment to him, despite 
his behavior does eventually lead to Jacob changing his life. We're going to see that in next week's lesson. He does come to repentance. He does reconcile at great risk to his life with his brother Esau. So the fact that God loves us does not justify being belligerent the rest of our life. Well, I can do whatever I want to. No. Have you heard how much God loves you? Don't you want to love God in return because of how deeply and passionately God is in love with you? So I'm asking you to recognize how deeply and passionately God is in love with you. And out of gratitude, I'm inviting you, like Jacob eventually did, to leave your past behind you because it will be forgiven. Today is a brand new day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the lesson of Jacob. What we've learned today, all of us have things in our life, skeletons in our closets, things that we would like people to just not remember about us. You've known them. You've seen them. You've seen the, the darkness in our hearts at times for other people. Certainly has been in mine. And yet, you love us anyway. You promised to fulfill for us all those promises you made known to us in Jesus Christ. So I'm hanging on to this promise. I may have gone in the wrong direction many times in my life, but you're not holding that against me any longer. You love me. And so I give thanks for that. And I pray for those at home who maybe have felt like they're unlovable, that they would give themselves over to you. Because there is nobody in your book whom you do not passionately and madly and deeply love. We just give you thanks, for it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.